our study is about the manta rays of Komono National Park. We used um, over five years of sightings data um, to identify uh, critical habitats for manta rays and how they use the area, um, how they move between them, and what threats that they might be facing. Um, my name is Elitza Germanoff, and I'm a senior scientist with the Marine Megafauna Foundation. This study was completed during my PhD research with Murdoch University under the direction of Professor Neil Lonergan. And I was supervised um, by a number of people, including Dr. Andrea Marshall, Dr. Simon Pierce, um, and my other study co-authors include um, Professor Gede Henderwan uh, from the University of Udayana and uh, Mr. Andy Kevy, who is a park ranger um, with the Komodo National Park, uh, as long, uh, along with Professor Lars Bejder, who is um, in the Hawaii University. Manta rays have gained um, big popularity uh, with the public and scientists alike. The number of um, studies on manta rays have exploded um, over the last decade, and we're learning a lot about them, but there's still so much we don't know. Um, and Komodo National Park was one of the first, one of the earlier places where studies were done on manta rays. Um, and they were actually, the last study there was done before manta rays, um, before the two different species of manta rays were classified. So um, yeah, it, it was um, 10 years ago. And now we know that there's two species of manta rays and potentially three. Um, so what my study goes into is looking at um, how manta rays use this park. So um, some of the key takeaways here is that the park hosts a really large, uh, um, large aggregations of manta rays. And this is great news um, because Indonesia is uh, one of the leading um, mobulid uh, fisheries countries up until about um, just shy of 10 years ago um, when manta ray protection came in, in effect in 2014. So um, it's great to see that there's a big aggregation sites that still remain within the Komodo National Park. Um, and some other interesting highlights that came out or uh, yeah, some insights that came out from the study are that manta rays seem to have um, different um, preferences for how they use specific sites. So we might have two sites which are commonly visited by manta rays and it might appear that it's uh, random, but when we actually start digging into the individual records um, and we can identify individual manta rays by different patterns that they have on their bellies, um, we can see that even though two sites might be just five kilometers apart, that um, specific manta rays have a preference for these sites. So very much the same way um, that other um, more uh, complex um, animals have. So, the implications for that are that um, if there are specific threats that uh, one part of um, their habitats might face, then that would disproportionately impact a specific, no, a specific group of individuals that potentially use this area. One thing that we found, um, for example, in one of the sites, uh, we see that there's a bigger proportion or a greater demographic of younger uh, manta rays that use that site and they are predominantly using that site for feeding. So if this site, for example, has a lot of boat traffic or uh, potential fishing activity, then these manta rays, which are the, seems to be the younger ones, uh, will be disproportionately impacted. So that's when we have to start thinking about different strategies uh, on how to best protect um, these different aggregation sites and the manta ray populations. One of the great things about this study is it actually um, was one that involved a great, a great amount of the public. Um, so over 95%, I believe 95% of the, the data that we actually used for this photo came from um, people who either worked in the tourism industry uh, in the Kamo National Park or were visitors to the area. So the way that this works is basically anyone who is spending time in the water and has an underwater uh, camera, like, you know, even like a GoPro or some other uh, low cost action camera, if they uh, manage to take a photo of, the, of a manta ray that exposes its belly, um, then each manta ray basically has a unique pattern that they maintain for their entire life. So 
like we have a, a fingerprint, we say the mantis have a belly print. Um, so this data can then, along with the time and the location, uh, is fed into the uh, global database for manta rays called Manta Matcher. Um, and yeah, it's through this crowdsourced data set that we were actually able to do this study. Um, and I was just blown, uh, blown away by how much um, the local diving community really wanted to participate uh, in the study, how they helped us. Um, to socialize the project by putting up posters um, and giving informational briefings to their guests um, and basically make the study a success. Because in order to collect this amount of data, over 4,000 photographs, uh, it, take, it would take a researcher like me to basically live underwater um, you know, during the entire time, which might sound fun, but it's pretty difficult to accomplish. I mean, I hope that people are inspired to get involved in similar citizen science projects, whether they be for manta rays uh, or other marine creatures or also terrestrial fauna as well. Um, depending on uh, how you spend your time outdoors, there's a citizen science project for you to help with uh, nature conservation. Um, but I also hope that um, this project um, inspires um, stakeholders. So, um, maybe uh, the dive operators within the national park. So one of the things that we did see from the study is that um, tourism had increased um, quite a lot from uh, the initial years of the study until kind of the final years of the study. Um, we've had a big break uh, thanks to the pandemic uh, in the uh, tourism pressure. But as uh, tourism does pick up again here, we want to make sure that it's done in a sustainable way um, to ensure that uh, pressure is reduced on some of these very famous sites where manta rays are sited. And the Komodo National Park has put a number of measures in place, for example, um, requiring uh, dive operators to basically book their dive um, and book their dive slots. So that would limit the number of people visiting some of these locations at the same time which has the added benefit not only of reducing pressure of the mantas by having less boats, less people, less noise uh, in the water, but also improves um, the experience for the people there because they get a more personable experience, uh, likely longer interactions with the animals. Um, so I just hope that with this study, um, there's more support and more uptake uh, from the stakeholders to follow these new regulations. Um, and that they understand why it's important um, to have them in place. Um, yeah, so on the other hand, um, because we still see manta rays um, within the park with fishing injuries, we do know that they travel outside the park up to 450 kilometers away um, in areas which are not um, as well looked after and likely um, are much more heavily fished. Um, but we do see manta rays with uh, evidence of encountering with fishing gear. So we, what, what we would like to see is, is uh, you know, improved uh, monitoring of illegal fishing activity within the park, um, but also thinking about potentially expanding um, to other areas um, that might turn out to be critical aggregation sites that are potentially adjacent to the park. So that's something in the for, for us for, for follow-up studies for sure. So one of the um, kind of good news stories that comes out of this study for me uh, in a country where mantra fisheries were very, very active uh, up until 2014 um, is that the Kamoa National Park does still maintain large aggregation areas uh, for manta rays. So what this highlights is that if a marine protected area is large enough um, to encompass key habitats for manta rays, then it does, have a, it does do a really good job uh, in manta ray conservation. And potentially this can be something that can be considered in other parts of the world where manta rays aggregate um, and to consider whether um, marine protected areas are large enough to encompass, for example, seasonal movements um, and um, different uh, demographics within the population. So juveniles, adults, uh, reproductive grounds, um, yeah. Well, I've read a number of uh, my colleagues' papers that have been published in Peer J. Um, I, I try to publish everything that I do as much as possible um, in an open source format. 
I primarily work in uh, low to middle income countries. Um, and I really believe that it's important to have as, as little barriers um, to information as possible, um, especially for institutions with, within these countries who might not have the ability to uh, subscribe to kind of more um, expensive journals or, you know, have library um, subscriptions. And, you know, conservation is a very much a multifaceted field. Um, and it, it very much depends on public buy-in. So for me, it's important that the general public also has uh, easy access to this information, um, you know, not just the academic community. It was great. Um, yeah, I found it uh, very helpful how there was different templates uh, provided, which allowed me to structure uh, my, my manuscript the right way from the beginning. Um, I think the instructions for the, you know, figures uh, were quite clear. I loved how they didn't bother too much with the uh, reference style in the initial phase of the manuscript subscription uh, uh, submission, because, you know, every journal has a different requirement for um, referencing style. So it was just nice to not have to think about that until I knew for sure it was accepted. So yeah, little things like that really go a long way to save us um, researchers time.